From the dark jungles of Southeast Asia to the midnight sun of the Aleutian Islands, join Dr. Patrick Bays as he travels the globe in search of the next shockingly true surgery story. Today's show is sponsored by CurePoint Orthopedic, Seattle's premier cell-based medicine center. Your body, your cells. And now, Cut Sheet. On December 1st, 1989, United States Air Force jets took to the skies over the Republic of the Philippines. Joining them were U.S. Naval Air Power from a carrier strike force that included the USS Midway and the USS Enterprise, both on deployment to Naval Station at Subic Bay. Now, Jungle General, the hospital where I worked and was stationed, sent out an emergency recall to all critical hospital personnel. Since I was one of two orthopedic surgeons stationed at the base, I rushed straight to the hospital. And what I found astounded me. I found a line of U.S. Marines, 40 deep, standing outside the orthopedic clinic in full battle gear and ready to deploy. The Marines were my patients, and I had seen and treated many of them in the days and weeks before, so I was very familiar with their wounds, their fractures, their strains and sprains, any orthopedic surgery problems that they were experiencing. Some of the Marines presented with long arm casts that I had applied myself, holding together broken bones and still mending from a surgery that I performed. Others were wearing walking casts or orthotics and using crutches to help them in their ambulation. And still others had some bloody surgical dressings that I had recently changed and needed to be changed again. I arrived at Jungle General and found one of the corpsmen that I had worked with for a period of time whose name was Jim. I asked Jim what the hell was going on. Jim said there had been a coup d'etat against the government of President Corzano Aquino, the current leader of the Philippines. Jim told me that the battalion leader of the Marines said that they needed every Marine that wasn't nailed or tied down, and they needed them now. Jim said that they had to deploy to the American Embassy in Manila to protect it, and that the choppers were ready and waiting. Now, I learned that the coup was being led by a colonel and a retired general that was being staged by something called the Reform the Armed Forces Movement, or RAM. And this was composed of soldiers that were also loyal to the former Filipino president, Ferdinand Marcos. The rebels had set up patrols around the runway of the Aquino International Airport and had shut it down. From an airbase, the rebels had launched planes and helicopters and were strifing and bombing the presidential palace, which was ready to fall. The Villamore Air Base, I learned, had already fallen. And the rebels were now seizing air bases in other locations including on the island of Cebu. President Aquino had been on the airwaves to address the people of the Philippines and declared with emphasis, we shall smash this naked attempt once more. For our part, the United States had formed a large special operations force named Operation Classic Resolve and had been authorized by President Bush to use lethal force if necessary. Now, the Marines were battle-ready and clamoring to join the fight. One Marine came up and told me, hey, he said, Doc, if you don't cut this cast off, I'm going to take a hacksaw to it. Many other Marines proclaimed the same intent, but with a little more salty language. And in less than an hour, we had serviced close to 40 Marines and could hear the helicopters heating up down on the flight line. Soon thereafter, the Marines, uh, our patients actually, had run to join the hundreds or so waiting on the flight line and to be honest, it was like a scene from the war movie Apocalypse Now. I looked up in the sky and marveled at the helicopter screaming towards Manila at treetop level. I'd been advised by people in the know that the choppers had to fly low and fast to avoid being detected by the rebel forces that could shoot them down if need be. Once the dust had cleared and we started to clean up the orthopedic clinic, I sat back and marveled at the irony of it all. Doctors are usually called upon to protect their patients at any cost. But in the military, the mission always comes first. And in a crisis, any Marine that can carry or shoot a weapon is more essential to the success of the mission than a non-displaced fracture or a post-operative wound infection. Still, I was concerned about my patient's welfare 
and I was concerned about any injuries that I might be required to treat should they be involved in live fire conflicts or get hurt in battle. Over the next few days, the tide was turned and the coup was put down, in large part because of the United States military support. But politically, the coup was a disaster for President Aquino. Her vice president, having allied himself openly with the rebels, called on Aquino to resign. The reliance of Aquino on the United States military to put down the coup was seen as a sign of weakness. Even more, the country's economy had plummeted after the coup attempt and potential investors had vaporized, having been frightened off by the fighting and the instability. Not long after the coup attempt, the United States military would be asked to leave their bases in the Philippines. After the incident, all Marines returned to Jungle General unscathed, other than some minor bumps and bruises, and my patients were able to continue their care. The only exception was a young Marine by the name of Johnny D. Now, Johnny D. had been rappelling down from a helicopter near the American Embassy when he came down hard on his right leg, sustaining a twisting injury to his right knee. He felt and heard a pop and had immediate pain and swelling to the right knee. Because of the pain and instability, he was unable to bear weight and had to be assisted into the American embassy by his fellow Marines. Now, Johnny D. reported to the emergency department for an orthopedic evaluation later in the day. The naval corpsman had placed him into a long leg brace to stabilize the knee. And when I removed the brace, I was able to get a fairly good idea as to what might be going on with Johnny D.'s right knee. The right knee had a significant amount of swelling, known as a joint effusion. The knee was unstable when I performed tests for ligament abnormalities. And as I obtained an MRI scan of the right knee, it showed evidence of a complete tear to the anterior cruciate ligament and the medial collateral ligament. There was also a tear to the medial meniscus, the cartilage on the inside of the knee, and evidence of damage to the thigh bone that helps form the part of the knee called the medial femoral condyle. The anterior cruciate ligament, or the ACL as it's commonly known, sits in front of the knee near the intercolonar notch in the middle portion of the knee and forms a cross with the posterior cruciate ligament to the PCL. Now, cruciate means cross-like, and so these ligaments crisscross one in front of the other. The ACL is commonly torn in athletic injuries. Often the MCL, or the medial collateral ligament, which is on the inside part of the knee, is also torn. In orthopedic surgery, a condition that involves tearing of the anterior cruciate ligament, the medial collateral ligament, and the medial meniscus is known as the unhappy triad of O'Donoghue, named after a famous sports medicine physician. Now, the injury sustained by Johnny D. meant that he would have to go to surgery so that I could address both the meniscus tear and the anterior cruciate ligament tear. Now, a day later, I took Johnny D. to surgery and performed what's called an examination under anesthesia. This allowed me to fully assess the stability of Johnny D.'s knee, and it was obvious that the major ligaments were torn and in need of repair. Arthroscopically, Johnny D. had a meniscus tear known as a bucket handle tear, meaning that it was detached along the peripheral attachment site, and part of the meniscus would pop out into the joint, almost like the handle of a bucket. I performed a partial meniscectomy, removing the part of the meniscus that had been torn. I then performed an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction using a large tendon that sits in the front of the knee called the patellar tendon. That's a common gold standard source that we use in orthopedic surgery to repair the ACLs. In addition, I looked at the end of the thigh bone over the region called the meiofemoral condyle, and I saw that it was significantly damaged by the direct impact of Johnny D's knee at the time of his injury. I was hopeful that this would improve with time, but I realized that Johnny D. may require a second operation to deal with the damage to the articular cartilage. Now, shortly after the coup attempt, I was called to Jungle General Hospital with another shockingly true surgery story. And as the name implies, Jungle General is located on the top of a hill in the middle of the jungle in the Subic Bay Naval Base area. The patient I was called on to see was a Filipino hose diver. Now, these divers are divers that go down into the water and breathe through a thin plastic hose, almost like a garden hose. And many times this is connected to a rusty air compressor on the boat that floats above them. 
Now, these fishermen can dive down as far as 20 or 30 or even 40 meters. This is known in the dialect of the Filipino community, Tagalog, as paaling. Now, this stripped down method of diving completely does away with traditional scuba diving equipment, such as regulators, spare regulators, and even mouthpieces. Thus, if something goes wrong, and frequently it does, like one of the hose breaks or develops a kink, these divers often die. These Filipino hose divers are workers that are often exploited by their employers, and the workers suffer under very harsh conditions. They often get very low pay, non-existent safety standards are implemented, and injuries are very common. Even death is quite common. Most often, the hose divers assist with herding or capturing of large schools of fish, like the skipjack tuna, that are herded into large nets. Some of these divers are more than 200 nautical miles away from land, miles and miles away from any decompression chambers or hospitals. These hose divers often stay at sea for months at a time. The most usual case of death is from decompression illness, or DCI, otherwise known as the bends. This condition arises when the diver ascends too fast, and for those that don't dive, Many times they are left with paralysis or severe headaches. The bends is also known as decompression sickness or DCS and occasionally occurs in traditional scuba divers or sometimes even individuals that are at high altitude or aerospace events. It occurs when dissolved gases, mainly nitrogen, come out of solution in bubbles that can affect just about any area of the body, including our joints, our lungs, heart, skin, and even brain. The bubbles of gas typically occur with changes in pressure during scuba diving. It can also occur in experienced commercial divers who use a specialized mixture of helium and oxygen that they breathe. In addition, it can occur in aviators or even astronauts that experience rapid changes in pressure. Now our patient at Jungle General presented with some very serious symptoms. Most of his pain complaints involved the major joints like his shoulders and his elbows, but also his hips, knees, and ankles were painful and uncomfortable when he presented to the emergency department. And he also had some extreme tiredness that seemed to be out of proportion to what you would normally expect with somebody who was just diving. Something was amiss. I noted that he had a red or marbled rash on the areas of the skin that weren't covered by the wetsuit that he was wearing. More importantly, he was developing neurological symptoms, and most of the time these involve the spinal cord. But in this particular case, our patient presented with severe low back pain. He felt a heaviness in his legs and even a source of or a sense of paralysis or numbness in the legs. He had not yet developed any sphincter loss or lack of control, and so he was still uh, had a continent uh, sphincter and bowel. But he was having severe symptoms like weakness and fatigue to the upper extremities in his chest, and he was also complaining of abdominal pains. He was dizzy and was confused, and he was starting to lose an awareness or lose some of his ability to know where he was in terms of space and time. In addition, when he underwent his neurologic examination, there was some loss or limited vision, and he was having some significant difficulty with balance and walking. But his most prominent pain was located in his head and his neck and into his torso and in his arms and legs. And he, he started having some ringing in his ears and even began to vomit. Now our hose diving patient was named Francisco. Francisco was a 22-year-old man who had only been hose diving for the last six months. Luckily, Francisco was diving not far from the Naval Hospital in pursuit of various types of seashells that could be sold at a handsome profit on the local market. Francisco had been diving around 60 to 80 feet below the surface of the water for a prolonged period of time, but unfortunately had not decompressed on his way back up. After his examination, I placed an immediate call to the chief diving officer at Subic Bay, who rushed to the hospital to see Francisco. In the United States Navy, patients with diving disorders are treated by the book according to the U.S. Naval Diving Manual. The person in charge of this type of work is the diving medical officer or the DMO. 
These physicians are the most highly trained for the treatment of diving-related injuries or conditions in the United States Navy. These specialized physicians are fluent in the procedures that are needed in emergent situations such as starting IV fluid lines and inserting chest tubes. Now, these DMOs are very well aware that the symptoms of severe decompression sickness may occur following seemingly uneventful dives. But when things go badly, very quickly, as was happening with our patient Francisco, the DMO is often the only person standing between life and death. DMOs are graduates of the Diving Medical Officer course and have a subspecialty called Basic Undersea Medicine. Often these specialized physicians have undergone a full residency program in undersea medicine. Because of the large number of dive-related incidents concerning hose divers in Subic Bay, Philippines region, our DMO, who I will refer to as Dr. Dan, had been a very busy man. Based on his evaluation of Francisco, Dr. Dan determined that he had the diagnosis of arterial gas embolism, or AGE. Francisco's signs included fatigue, difficulty thinking, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, bloody sputum, tremors, and loss of coordination. He had also developed small air bubbles just beneath the surface of the skin called subcutaneous emphysema. It was determined that Francisco needed immediate recompression treatment. The primary purpose of recompression treatment is to compress gas bubbles to the smallest volume possible, thus relieving local pressure and restarting the blood flow. The patient must remain in the chamber long enough to allow the bubbles to be reabsorbed and thus increase blood oxygen to the injured tissues. Francisco was rushed to the recompression chamber. Along the way, he was breathing 100% oxygen and was receiving IV fluids. We made certain that Francisco was horizontal and wrapped in warm blankets. We carefully monitored him for any signs of an obstructed airway and cessation of breathing or any cardiac complications. After Francisco was placed in the recompression chamber, I returned to Jungle General as I had just been paged to see a new patient. Jungle General emergency room was in full crisis mode when I arrived. Apparently, three Navy SEALs had been diving on a training exercise when something unbelievable happened. Now, they were submerged about 60 feet below the surface of the water in an area around Green Beach when a loud explosion occurred. One of the divers had his regulator blown completely out of his mouth and his dive mask was blown off his head. A second diver was knocked unconscious. The third diver was stunned but uninjured. Once the first diver retrieved his dive mask and his regulator, he immediately swam over to assist the unconscious diver. The other two divers were able to get the unconscious diver to the surface and initiate basic life support measures. There were some SEAL team members on the surface who had already radioed ahead for medical assistance, and by the time I arrived, the three SEALs were being evaluated. By then, the unconscious man had regained consciousness, but he appeared to have a concussion. I noted that there was blood coming from his ear and an inspection revealed he had blown out his tympanic membrane or his eardrum. From an orthopedic surgery standpoint, he had a fracture to his right collarbone or clavicle, and he also had fractured two of his ribs. One of those rib fractures had actually caused his lung to partially collapse, and I knew that he would need a chest tube inserted to reinflate the lung. A CT scan of the head and neck revealed that he had a skull fracture, but there was no bleeding to the brain, luckily. Once stabilized, the patient was transported to the intensive care unit. I decided to treat the clavicle with a simple figure of eight splint and an arm sling for the time being. So what was the cause of the explosion? Well, it was revealed that there were two Filipino fishermen fishing in a small boat very near where the seals were training but they weren't using traditional fishing techniques like lines or nets. They were using dynamite. Blast fishing or dynamite fishing is the practice of using explosives to stun or kill schools of fish for easy collection. The practice is illegal and can be extremely destructive to the surrounding ecosystems as the massive explosions often destroy the coral reefs that support the fish. Although outlawed, the practice remains widespread in Southeast Asia. In the Philippines, blast fishing has been known prior to World War I. 
In 1999, a report estimated that some 70,000 fishermen, or 12% of the total fishermen in the Philippines, engaged in dynamite fishing. Commercial dynamite, or more commonly homemade bombs constructed using a glass bottle with layers of pebbles mixed with powdered potassium nitrate, or in some cases, pebbles mixed with an ammonium nitrate and kerosene mixture for even more deadly effects, have been used for years to create these explosions. Such devices, however, may also explode prematurely and without warning and have been known to kill or severely injure the fishermen or even innocent bystanders. The underwater shock waves produced by the explosion stun the fish or cause their swim bladders to rupture. This rupture causes a loss of buoyancy. A small amount of the fish float to the surface, but most sink to the ocean floor. The explosions indiscriminately kill large numbers of fish or other marine animals in the vicinity with devastating effects on the coral reefs. These underwater shockwaves can also kill or severely injure divers that happen to be nearby, as the Navy SEALs were in this instance. Now, admittedly, I'm no Navy SEAL, but when I first arrived in the Philippines, I did have an opportunity to take my diving certification classes, and I did do some recreational scuba diving. And I can attest to the effects of dynamite fishing firsthand. Although I wasn't directly under the location of the blast as the Navy SEALs were, I was close enough to feel what the effects of dynamite are like when you're underwater. And to be perfectly honest with you, it scares the hell out of you. I checked on my Navy SEAL patient in the ICU on a regular basis. Several days after he had been admitted, his chest tube was removed because the lung x-rays revealed that the lung had been reinflated. We also had our ears, nose, and throat doctor take a look at the patient's ruptured tympanic membrane or eardrum. The ENT doctor felt that the eardrum would go on to heal spontaneously and would not require an operation, though he did say that there may be some scar tissue, which could lead to a hearing deficit. We had Jungle General's neurologist evaluate the seal for his concussion and for his skull fracture. And it was felt that once the skull fracture had healed, the concussive effects would resolve and the Navy seal would go on to a full and complete recovery. Soon, the patient was transferred out of the intensive care unit and onto a regular floor. And now, since he had stabilized from his more serious injuries, I had an opportunity to develop a plan to deal with his fractured right collarbone. Because of the significant force associated with the dynamite blast that occurred underwater for our naval SEAL patient, I felt that he had a serious fracture to his right collarbone, and I ordered some additional x-rays and a CT scan. Now, normally, most, most collarbone fractures heal on their own. They don't require any kind of an operation. But in this case, because of the significant overlap of the fracture fragments and due to severe comminution, meaning that the fracture fragments were in multiple pieces, I felt that the patient would require an operation. Therefore, I took our Navy SEAL patient to surgery and performed a fracture fixation procedure using a specialized device known as a reconstruction plate. This special type of orthopedic hardware is very malleable, meaning that I can bend it to any position that I want. Uh, any, anything I want it to form, I can do. It's easy to bend and move around. This makes wrapping the plate around the collarbone much easier. I decided to use bone graft that I took from the patient's iliac crest. Bone graft is a specialized uh, type of material that orthopedic surgeons frequently employ in difficult fractures because it has stem cells that allow new bone to grow, which I felt was important in this case. The surgical procedure went well, and after about eight weeks, it appeared that the Navy SEAL's collarbone had completely healed. He had full range of motion to his shoulder and was having no pain. Now, lest we forget about Francisco, our hose diver, who had developed serious complications on one of his hose dives, the information from Dr. Dan, our diving medical officer, was very encouraging. And after adequate time in the recompression chamber, our patient Francisco's symptoms had markedly improved. Gone were the symptoms of fatigue and difficulty thinking. Gone was the vertigo, nausea, and bloody sputum. 
and gone were the tremors and loss of coordination. More importantly, there was no evidence of residual neurologic abnormalities. Because of Francisco's close proximity to the recompression chamber at our naval base at Subic Bay, he had dodged a very close call, one that could have resulted in permanent neurologic abnormalities, including paraplegia or quadriplegia, or even death. And finally, there's our patient, Johnny D., Recall that Johnny D. was one of the Marines that responded to the attempted coup d'etat on December 1st, 1989 against the government of Corazon Aquino, the president of the Philippines. Johnny D. was one of the Marines that was sent by helicopter to guard the American embassy. Remember that he was the one that was repelling down from a helicopter and sustained a serious injury to his right knee. He suffered what we call the unhappy triad of O'Donoghue, which meant that he had torn his anterior cruciate ligament, his medial collateral ligament, and his medial meniscus. Johnny D is the patient that I took to surgery and performed an arthroscopic anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction using his patellar tendon as a graft. I also removed a bucket handle meniscus tear from his right knee. Now, Johnny D's knee had gone on to heal and had been stable when I saw him six months later. But unfortunately, he still had some complaints of pain to the inside portion of his medial compartment. That was the part of the knee joint where I had hoped that it would heal spontaneously because I'd noticed some damage to the articular surface of the thigh bone or the femur when I did his arthroscopic surgery. But unfortunately, a CT scan that I performed showed that Johnny D had developed what's known as an osteochondral defect. This simply means that the cartilage, that white pristine material that surrounds the ends of our bones at the joints, had been damaged, and this damage had caused it to dissolve all the way down to the underlying bone. So, Donnie D would require another operation. And so, the next day, I took Johnny D to surgery to perform what was called a microfracture procedure. This simply involved arthroscopically drilling multiple small holes through the defect of the articular cartilage directly into the underlying bone. At the time, this was a revolutionary new technique that was designed to utilize the amazing capacity of stem cells that are found deep in the bone marrow. These stem cells would be unleashed by the small drill holes that we drilled into the bone. And these stem cells could not only form new bone, if that's what was required, but in Johnny D's case, they had the capacity to become articular cartilage, which is what he needed the most. And after about eight months, the articular cartilage had been reconstituted over an area about the size of a quarter inside of Johnny D's knee. That's the area of the cartilage that was destroyed. It had been reconstituted, and Johnny D was having no pain when I saw him eight months later. And thus, this dedicated Marine was released to full duty with no restrictions and was back doing what he loved doing the most, being a Marine. I hope that you have enjoyed today's presentation of Cut Sheet, and I hope you tune in next week as we delve into new and exciting, shockingly true surgery stories. My name is Dr. Patrick Bays, your host on Cut Sheet.